Hey everybody, I'm back again with another Project Lead the Way lesson. This is lesson 2.3.8, Water Supply. And so we're just going to get right into it because there's a lot of stuff to cover right now. Uh, you can see the table of contents here about why we're treating water and the uses, but really we're going to spend a lot of time talking about the distribution and how we can get water from either an aquifer or a body of water into our house, the steps that it needs to take to get there, and more specifically we are going to spend a bunch of time talking about calculating the water supply pressure. So why is it important to treat the water? Well, society realized the long ago that human health and the welfare of the general population are improved if the public water supplies are treated prior to use. So we're not just using any old stagnant water, we are trying to use the best quality water so it doesn't carry disease. So uh, nowadays, nearly every structure that is uh, put up needs to have a water supply. And there's also some rules that say that the appropriate flow rate, pressure, and water quality are necessary for effective use. If you have a lower amount of pressure or flow rate, you need to add in additional flow or pressure. If you have too much, you need to limit that as well. So in a residential situation, we are using a lot of water for bathing and toilets and cleaning, food preparation, you can so on and see. You can see all the, the other examples there. Um, important to note that something that is drinkable water, drinking water, is called potable water. So sometimes in some houses there are uh, distinctions between potable water, drinkable water, and gray water. That's not something that we talk about specifically in this lesson, but in other ones where we were talking about lead credits, where you can recycle some of the water in the house. Uh, say like, for example, water that goes down the drains in a sink or a tub or for clothes washing might be able to be reused in say like a toilet or for outside irrigation uses if you store that um, on site somewhere. That's called gray water. So a basic water supply system looks like this where you have a water supply somewhere. Now that can, we're going to talk about some of the different places you can get the water from, but that can be on the surface, it can be below the surface, um, and it can be a water tower as well. So you can get that water supply from somewhere. It goes through a treatment process. And after the treatment process to clean it, um, sometimes UV light is used, sometimes chemicals are used, um, sometimes combinations of all sorts of different stuff. That can be pumped into a storage tank. I know here in Ephrata, we have a lot of different uh, storage tanks all around, some in Akron, there's some out in uh, Lincoln, those storage tanks hold on to water and they also help to keep the pressures up because they store them up high. Then it comes downhill from there and it goes, branches out and goes to different consumers. So what happens when you want to get water? Well, there's a couple of different places that you can get it from. Uh, aquifers are groundwater. They are a primary source of drinking water because it's typically a little bit cleaner water that's coming from the ground, believe it or not. Um, what happens is rainwater or any other surface water slowly sinks down through the ground and it is um, basically cleaned and filtered by all these different uh, minerals and rocks and dirt and everything that it flows through. That picks up all of the bad stuff in it and it kind of sits in this thing called the saturated zone. And it's not like you are uh, opening up a underground pond or, or a cavern or something like that that you're dipping a straw into. It's more just that the water is saturated down in the ground, and when you dig down into it, the well and a pump is used to remove that water. So you see over here, the groundwater is just sort of saturated in there, and when you drill into it, if you create a cavity, that water will be allowed to fill into that cavity. So you, when you drill a well, some of you might have well water 
when you drill a well, you basically make a big metal sleeve for most of it, and then down at the very bottom, you leave it open, and that water is kind of allowed to just fill into that cavity, and then that's where a pump is, and that pump will pump it up to either a small storage tank directly on uh, your own property, or if this is a larger um, uh, commercial application, it might store into a, a very large tank. You can also just get water right off the surface from either a lake, a reservoir, or a river. Um, rivers can be dammed to create reservoirs. Reservoirs can also be man-made um, in smaller cases like on a property or on a farmland to store water during a heavy rain or a snow. So you can fill up reservoirs on site if you have uh, specific operations that require lots of, lots of water constantly coming through your, uh, your property. Again, water treatment, it depends on the amount uh, and quality of the source of water as to how much treatment you actually need. Groundwater, like I said before, usually requires a little bit less treatment because it's already been filtered by the ground, by the earth. Now, when we get into the water storage, uh, you use a pump to pump it from the ground or from underground, and then you pump it up into a storage tank. And there is a reason why these storage tanks are oftentimes at the very top of a hill and um, that they are also oftentimes way up in the air. So for every uh, amount of feet that you can push the water up into the tank, there is going to be an associated pressure that relates to that. So 1 PSI equals 2.31 feet of water. So if I pump that um, water up to be a little over 6 feet, I get 2 PSI out of it. And you can understand that if you go way up, like 60, 70 feet up in the air, that's going to really start adding up into extra pressure just of the water pushing down on top of itself. So in a water distribution system, it usually consists of water lines, fittings, valves, service lines, meters, fire hydrants. There's lots of stuff that can get in the way and slow the water down. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But there are basically two different kinds of systems. There's a loop system and a branch system. Um, as you can see by these pictures here, the loop system has two different inlets and there are lots of different loops that are associated in here and there's lots of different places for it to go. Water flows in more than one direction and there are some isolation valves to make sure that there aren't um, pressures fighting each other so that this pump over here or pressure is not pushing backwards against this one. So there might be some one-way valves in here or some manually adjusted or automatic valves to be able to let water flow all through this. A branch system is not as desirable because it only starts on one end and then each of these houses get branched off from there. So if you've ever been in the shower when somebody else is trying to do a load of laundry or flushes the toilet and you start feeling uh, the water pressure go down because you are in the shower at the end of the house that you're in. Um, that same thing can actually happen on a bigger scale when you are in a branch system. So let's say, just for an example, this first person on the left up here is using a ton of water. That might actually slow down the rest of the water pressure coming in through this branch system. Um, it probably wouldn't be a noticeable difference if it was only houses along here, but if this was a branch system with some sort of a bigger commercial use up here, or even just like a farmland or somebody that's using lots and lots of water for irrigation or something, that could really slow down the rest of the system. So when you're talking about water distribution, um, there are a series of pipes that are essentially invisible to us out in the street, out on almost every road. Um, now, when in our area, when you're starting to get out there to the farmlands and you're getting uh, miles and miles in between houses and stuff like that, then there's not as many underwater pipes. 
but especially when you're in town and when you're just a little bit more out into the suburbs, there are pipes that are down below our feet. And if you are talking about a brand new system that's going in, anything from uh, probably even the 80s and beyond, more than likely it's going to be um, thermoplastic or ductile iron, and it's reinforced concrete in larger areas. But if you are um, talking about, say, downtown Ephrata and places where that's a little bit older of a system, that could very easily be cast iron or even asbestos cement, um, which is clearly not a great idea nowadays since we know that asbestos causes cancer. Um, and, and lead pipes, by the way, as well, is uh, mixed in there all the time with uh, places from the usually about the 40s and below, so the 20s, 30s, 40s. Um, and each of these water pressure water uh, lines are carrying somewhere between 65 and 75 psi pounds per square inch of, of pressure, and they are designed for less than 150 psi. So it's important to know that this is not um, just going to be able to uh, uh, handle a ton of pressure. If anything over 150 psi can easily create leaks and damage to the system. So for a, a residential or a commercial or industrial facilities that everybody's going to have some different uses. Residential, when you come to uh, the pressures that are coming inside your house, typically they are between 40 and 80 PSI. If you're below 40, you might need to add a pump onto your system to be able to, providing that you have enough flow coming into the house, like the gallons per minute is enough for the usage for the house you might need to add a pump to actually add a little bit of pressure to it. If you have above 80 PSI, you will need to add a pressure reducing valve because again, um, anything over about 60 PSI is considered high and can actually do damage to the pipes that are inside your house. Commercial or industrial facilities obviously might need a lot more uh, flow and they might need a lot higher pressure than that as well. So we're getting into this definition of the uh, head pressure for um, a fluid. Now, when we're talking about fluids like water, we're usually trying to think about incompressible fluids. So air is not an incompressible. Air can be compressed. So that's a different thing altogether. But water is considered incompressible. So no matter what pressure you put onto it, it's not going to shrink in size. Um, and when we have a pipe full of water and we have a length of a uh, tube sticking out of that, we can measure the pressure and we measure that in something called the fluid's head. And it is a, um, a column of water that's, that's uh, open, open to the pressure. So when we look at an example of um, trying to get into the calculations involved, we have to have a couple of definitions. So static head is the potential energy of the water at rest. So when it's just sitting there in the pipes or in the storage container, we want that thing to be able to, um, we're, we're measuring the pressure at the bottom of it. That is what's called the static head. It's measured in feet of water. So again, we're talking about like the, the distance of, of how much that water is sort of resting on top of itself. And the change in elevation between the source of the, and the discharge. So if the water tower pictured here is 70 feet tall, and we are talking about the pressure that's down at the bottom of it, that would be the static head of this system. We are actually going to be talking about the static head between this system and where its elevation is in land compared to the entire thing later on down the line, like further down the road, uh, maybe a mile, maybe a couple hundred feet down the road, and a different elevation change from there. So you might have hundreds of feet of elevation change. As an example, what is the static head at a residential supply line if the water level in the elevated tank is 943 feet and the elevation at the supply line is 890 feet. So this is just a simple 
subtraction, we're just going to take the total elevated tank at 943 feet and the elevation at the supply line, we're going to subtract 890 from that and we would end up with 53 feet of water. That would be what we would call the static head of that system. Something called static pressure is the water pressure at rest, the pressure of that water at rest. That is measured in pounds per square inch. And going back to an earlier slide, that information is um, that for every 2.31 feet of water, that equals one PSI. So if we were talking about that same 53 feet of distance that we had before, what is the static pressure at the distribution if the static head is 53 feet of water? That would be 53 times the 1 PSI over 2.31 feet. You do that multiplication and you end up with 22.9 PSI. So is that a water pressure that would be able to be used at a house? No, the answer is no. That's not going to be nearly enough water pressure for a house. So how far above the supply line, basically the house, how far above that house must the water level be in a water tower in order to be able to get to that 40 PSI uh, pressure that we're looking for at a building? If you do that, Calculation out, 40 PSI times the 2.31 feet of water means that we would need to have a distance of 92.3 feet uh, to be able to get up to 40 PSI. The only problem with that is that there are lots of water pressure losses as it travels through a pipe. So when we're talking about losses through pipes, we're going to call it something called head loss. Um, that's the energy due to friction as the water moves through the distribution pipe, uh, the distribution system. It's going to be all the pipes, all the fittings, all the elbows, tees, reducers, any equipment that might be in the way. Um, all of those things are going to slow it down because usually it needs to go down through a smaller size or it's just rubbing against the inside of the pipe. Even those things over long periods can really slow the water down. There's something called major losses, which is a head loss associated with the friction in the length of pipe. And then there are minor losses, which are head loss associated with the bends, the fittings, the valves. And um, those are all calculated into something called the Hazen-Williams formula. Now this looks really complicated at first, and one of the things that I think is really interesting about this um, Hayes and Williams formula is that it was it was contrived. It was invented because people tested it and it continues to work. So when let's start looking at some of the parts of it here. So HF over here on the far left, Hayes and Williams, what we're looking for is the head loss. Um, that's due to the friction of the pipes. L is the length of the pipe. So just thinking about it, if you have a longer pipe, you are going to lose a little bit more. And that gets multiplied in to the flow rate of the water, so the gallons per minute. Now, um, the length in the gallons per minute, that's on the top. That gets multiplied by that 10.44. And again, this was arrived at, that 10.44 was made because that's the number that works and they just continue to try this with different lengths of pipe different different materials and things like that and it just continues to work the next one is this hazen williams constant and you multiply that by one uh, uh, to the 1.85 power and that one is related to what kind of pipe it is we're going to cover that in just a second and then D is the diameter of the pipe in inches, okay? Um, important to note that it's in inches because there are some pipes that are big enough that it's in feet. 
<clears throat> All right, so the Hazen-Williams constant, that letter C that we just saw, you're going to come up with that value based on what kind of material the pipe is made out of. So you can see that um, a brand new clean pipe that is cast iron or wrought iron is going to be this number 130. But when you start really using it, you're going to use this design value of 100. So there's a big difference between that. And you can see that that 100 fits well within that typical range. And the reason for that is that over time, some pipes will corrode. You can see that the, the cast iron and wrought iron will have a really sh uh, a steep drop off along with the steel down here because the pipes may corrode, they may rust a whole lot more. Um, plastic, PVC, or ABS, that has a very low um, drop off from 140 as a clean brand new pipe down to 130. And similarly in copper, glass, or brass, and cement line, um, those numbers don't drop off that much because those type of pipes don't really uh, like they don't rust away and they don't get a lot of stuff building up inside of them. And then when we talk about minor losses, uh, the Hazen-Williams formula is only for calculating straight pipe. When you have the minor losses, you need to figure out the equivalent length for each fitting to account for that. So the accepted equivalent length values are posted onto a uh, table. So I'll show you those here. So let's just think for a second. If you had a pipe size that is 10 inches in diameter, okay, this is in inches across the top here, 10 inches in diameter, and you have a regular 45 degree angle. So you're coming in and then you're moving at a 45 degree angle. That angle, that 45 degree, one fitting in 10 uh, inch wide pipe is equivalent to nine feet of actual linear pipe. So if you have nine feet of regular pipe, the water is going to slow down the same amount in nine feet in a straight pipe than it would in one 45 degree bend going the other uh turning 45 and going the other way. So that same nine feet of distance is all gathered into that 145 degree angle pipe. Uh, you can see looking at a regular 90 degree elbow, uh, you really lose a lot of space when you're trying to turn 90 degrees. So going straight and then turning just directly left or directly right or something like that. Um, this long radius 90 degree elbow means that it comes in and has a more gentle radius to it, which means that it's not going to lose as much. So you have to uh, look at each one of these in the pipes that you are going to be calculating um, for your entire head loss system. So when we look at this next question here, so the example that we're going to give, we have to figure out a lot of information before we can even really start typing it into the Hazen Williams formula. So let's look at it. A 10 inch flanged cast iron water supply pipe provides service to a home. The pipe between the water tower and the meter includes seven regular 90 degree elbows, three line flow tees, 11 branch flow tees, six gate valves between the water tower and a service connection to the residence. What is the equivalent length of those fittings and valves? So if you would go back to that, um, to that chart and take a look at that, you would find that the regular 90 degree elbows, they are equivalent length of 14 feet. Again, this is for the 10 inch, 10 inch pipe. There's seven of them. You multiply that out, 98 feet total length. Line flow tees, three of those. 5.2 equivalent length feet multiplied out 15.6. So on for the branch flow and the gate valve, you total all of those up and just in the elbows and T's and other things that you're going to have in line, you have 462.8 feet total equivalent length feet that you are losing um, that head loss uh, because of just those those angles in there, okay? 
So if we are looking at the, the question that you might see on your assignment, it's going to say something similar to, what is the head loss in a 10-inch cast iron pipe supply line with a flow rate of 110 gallons per minute if the pipe is 3.2 miles long and includes the fittings from the previous slide? So we're going to have to find a bunch of things. So the first thing that we're going to do is calculate the length of the pipe into, uh, from miles into feet. So you see 3.2 miles. 5280 for the uh, feet per mile means that there are 16,896 feet. Next, we're going to figure out the total equivalent length because we're going to add in those fittings that we had. The length of the, the total equivalent length is the pipe length, 16,896, plus the equivalent length of the fittings, which was 462.8. You come up with a total length of 17,358.8. Now, we go into the Hazen-Williams formula, and we start breaking this down. You take the 10.44, which is a given, times the length of the pipe, which we found out to be 17,358.8, you multiply that times the gallons per minute, that was the Q, 110 gallons per minute, that is to the one, uh, 1 1.85, all right? That's on the top half. On the bottom, we're using the design standard for a cast iron pipe, which was a 100 on that Hazen-Williams constant, that's what the C is for, that gets to the 1.85 power, and that's multiplied by 10 inches for the pipe diameter, and that is to the 4.8655 power. Now, I know that there are a lot of numbers in there, so I want you to pause this and type this into your calculator until you get it right. And the thing that can really trick you is the the, the parentheses to the power, you want to do those first, then do the multiplication. So you're doing the, you're going back to um, like eighth or ninth grade math class and figuring out what is the order of operations that you need to do. So type this into your calculator until you get it right, and the correct answer is going to appear right now 2.94 feet. That is what we are looking for. That is our head loss. So essentially, really bringing this back to your definition, we are losing roughly three feet of height, and you could figure out how much that is in pressure in just a second, but we're losing three feet of height just based on the type of pipe that we have and the distance that it has to travel and all the fittings that it has to go through. So. That's what we just figured out, is how much head loss for the given pipe length and type of pipe that we have. Now, if you wanted to figure out what that is in actual lossing, losses for a um, moving fluid, that's something called dynamic head. So it's the head of a moving fluid. It's measured in feet of water, similar to how static head was measured. Dynamic head just equals static head minus the head loss. That's basically saying, like, what will we actually end up with? And the dynamic or actual pressure, they are interchangeable as far as the terms go. The actual pressure or dynamic pressure, doesn't matter which way you say it, is the dynamic head from the last slide times the 2.31 feet which is the amount of one PSI for that height of water. So really trying to bring the whole thing back around again. You're looking at what is the water level in the water tower supplying the home in the previous example is at 1487 feet, 1,487 feet. The elevation of the supply line at the residence 
is 1,246 feet. Find the static head, the static pressure, the dynamic head, and the actual pressure of the water as it enters the residence. So I'm going to um, click on to the next slide, and I want you to, as I am doing this, I want you to try and do your own calculations to see if you can get it right as we go along. So the first thing, the static head is the difference in elevation between the water level in the tank and the water at the supply line level. So in that example, it was 1,487 minus 1,246, 241 feet. The static pressure is just a conversion of that static head. So you're taking the 241 feet times the 2.31 uh, feet per PSI, and you're calculating that out for the static pressure, and that's going to equal 104.3 PSI. We found the head loss on the previous slide, that's the major and the minor head loss, 2.94 feet, just about 3 feet, and so now we're going to find the dynamic head, <clears throat> which is the static head from the top, 241 up here, minus the head loss, 2.94. That one's a pretty simple one. That equals 238.1 feet. And then finally, we can get down to the dynamic pressure, which is what you would expect to actually see flowing out of the house. So the dynamic pressure is going to be 238.1 feet times the 1 PSI for 2.31 feet equals 103.1 PSI. So if you think about this, is this an acceptable pressure for a residence? No, the answer is no because the pressure is too high it's over that 80 PSI, it's over the 60 PSI that we would consider to be high pressure. So in most places, you are going to need to install a pressure reducing valve to reduce that pressure down to a usable pressure for the house. If you expected to try and use that 103 PSI at the house, you would have a major problem with a lot of the fixtures um, over the years would probably wear out a lot too quickly. So thank you for following along with this. I know it's a lot, but the reason why I'm putting it into a video is so that hopefully you can go back through and follow through the calculations again, trying to figure it out. If I had to point to one thing that's the most difficult thing in this whole uh, assignment, it's figuring out how to get the Hazen-Williams formula multiplied out, finally getting the right answer. Do the top, do the bottom, divide those two together. Okay? Good luck. We'll talk to you later.